Monroe, when someone has written 60 books, 49 of which are best sellers, who goes around the world, he's visited 132 countries around the world. On this particular tour of Africa, he's visiting nine countries. And it's all about leadership. It's all about change through leadership. That's what he's all about. He's a motivator, inspiration leader. He's, he, he's every, he's, I tell you, what a man, what a man. And he's here to tell us or give us hope, especially those of you out there who feel there is no hope for tomorrow. Listen to this man, because he was telling me a little, a short while ago, he used to sleep with roaches and rats. Look at the man now, sit back. His Twitter handle is at Miles Monroe. Mine is at Queen Anger. Jeff, the hashtag is JKL. He is the president and founder of the Bahamas Faith Ministries International, Dr. Miles Monroe. Wow. My brother. What an introduction. Oh, my. What a man. Thank you so much, what a Jeff. Man. And that's just a tiny little bit. It's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, listen, just sitting next to you make me want to get started real fast. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for the privilege of being here on your show and I'm so excited about uh, the impact mm. that you're having uh, not only on the lives of people but the mentality of a whole nation yes and I think that's so critical so it's a ple pleasure to be back in Kenya mm. it's my second time being in Kenya it's good. I that's, couldn't wait to get back I was here last year that's a good sign that's a good sign that's a good sign yes and I plan to be back many more times so uh, hopefully uh, we can maybe find some place me to invest some money here my man. <laughs> My man, I could, I could talk about a couple of places, but I'll tell you about it later. I could always build a studio. We could do something together. Hello, uh -huh. Miles Koinanga Studio. <laughs> I'm going to tell our viewers about a couple of places you're going to be visiting or you're going to be speaking at in the next couple yes. of days. We'll talk about it very shortly. But first of all, you were telling me you, you used to sleep with rats, rats and roaches. Yes. Come on, come on, dog. You can well, you know, people normally look at you and they think that you were born the way you are. And that's impossible. Every successful person has a story. Their story is more important than their success. Don't ever be jealous of a successful person because you don't know their story. I was born where I still live. I live in the Bahamas, the place where God lives, of course. <laughs> and, but he uh, visits Kenya? He visits Kenya very often. Thank you. Always comes back home. I'm sure he's here now because I came. But oh. anyhow, uh, uh, I was born in a beautiful island nation called the Bahamas. We consist of 700 islands uh, in the Caribbean, just south of Florida, independent country, former British colony. Mm -hmm. We speak English, same history as Kenya. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very much at home when I come to Kenya, like I'm seeing my cousins, because we all have the same history, colonialism. Uh, I was born in a family of 11 children. One mother, one father, 11 kids. Wow. I am number six. I was born in a wooden house with four big rocks that hold it up off the ground in a small little island, seven miles wide, 20 miles long. I was born in the lowest income area of that island, a village called Bange Town. Uh, we had basically, we, we, didn't even, we didn't know we were poor, mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, wooden house, two bedrooms, one for my mother and father, one for my seven sisters. So the four boys slept on the floor. And I remember my mother planting a mat out of straw as my mat to sleep on. I slept with a dirty sheet many nights. Mosquitoes ate me alive. I would wake up in the morning with blood over my body as I scratched from the mosquitoes eating me alive and the hot steaming temperatures of the island. Of course, roaches and rats run over my body. And this is the way I started my life. Uh, we were very close family. We didn't have hardly anything, but we were close. It was a loving family. And the, the first thing I would say today that my mother and father gave us uh, they couldn't give us a lot of material things, but they gave us values. They gave us a sense of uh, moral conscience. They gave us a, a, a belief in God, which is very important. And they gave us a hope that we can achieve anything we dream. And then, Doc, at the age of 13, and I read this story and I loved it. At the age of 13, you had a sort of an epiphany, if you will. Yes. Because you ended up getting into the New Testament, reading the four Gospels. There are four of them, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's correct. Oh, thank you. At the age of 13, what made you do that? Well, I began to question uh, my life. Uh, we were, of course, being brought up on an island where there was 98% black people in my country. All the power and the economy is in the hands of 4% white people. So as a young kid, this was a concern for me. Uh, the 4% was rich and wealthy, 98% poor, depressed. And my father was a Baptist preacher, 
So I asked my father, uh, is God prejudiced? Is God racist? Why does God make those people rich and we poor? Why are they on that side of the fence and we on this side of the fence? Why can't we go to their schools? Why can't we drink to their fountains? Why can't we go to their cinemas? I mean, it was apartheid basically in our nation. Yeah. And so my father couldn't answer me. Uh, being a pastor, I thought he could have you know, at least con you know, consoled me. But he said, look, son, it's just the way it is. We got to accept this. And I'm thinking, this can be the way it is because if God loves and if God is wealthy and God is powerful, why am I poor? Why am I sleeping with roaches and rats? Why am I living in, you know, on a mat? Mm. And Why so, are you being called a nigger? Oh, listen, the names that they called us was amazing. Mm. All of my teachers were white teachers from Scotland, England, Wales, and their attitude toward us was not the best. And so I grew up with this very oppressive, depressing environment. But I decided if there is a God, I need to meet him myself because I don't like the one my father's talking about. <laughs> and uh, 13 years old, I went out in, a, in a, that wooden house out on the island, looking at the sky, I saw the stars, and I said, if you were there, say something to me. Nothing. I said, if you were there, show me a sign. Nothing. I said, if you, if you were there, uh, show me some evidence you exist. Nothing. And I became very frustrated as a teenager, and I said, I guess God doesn't exist. And then I heard a voice in my mind. The voice simply said, I never told you to see me, hear me, touch me, or feel me. I told you to believe me. If you believe I exist, you believe in me, then I will reveal myself. So here I am, 13 years old, <clears throat> I'm hearing this voice and I go, okay, I believe you exist. And then the voice says, yes, but the devils also believe I exist. Mm -hmm. So then the voice says, don't just believe I exist, believe me. I said, believe you what? Believe what I said. I said, what did you say? Then the voice says, read the four gospels. So 13 years old, I picked up the Bible, couldn't understand all this stuff, this book called the Bible. Yeah. And uh, I began to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four go Gospels of the New Testament. And I read them through. By the time I was 14 years old, I had memorized the entire four Gospels. Memorized them. I knew everything about the content. And what happened to me was I was introduced to a perspective of God I never saw before. And that changed the way I thought about myself, about the world, about people. And I began to believe that nothing was impossible. And so from that point, I went to school, age 14, I had a white teacher from Scotland, Mr. Robinson. Hmm. Mr. Robinson came to the class, 38 little black kids, and he began to talk to us about the fact that we were, in, we were not complete humans, we were half-breed humans, black people can't learn sophisticated things. He told me that I was a half-breed monkey, I will never learn, uh, my brain was not developed properly, I was retarded. Teacher in school? The teacher told us this. And he stood before my desk and hit on the desk. He says, you're stupid, you're black, you're a nigger, you can't learn, you are retarded, you are, you are uneducable. I mean, the words, I remember the words. And I sat there weeping as a kid. Because this, this man was telling us these things, and I was an F student in his class. Mm -hmm. F, failing student. Yep. So my conclusion was, maybe he's right. He says, you're a half-breed monkey, retarded, uneducable nigger. Mm. I said, maybe he's right. I went home and told my mom. I said, mom, the teacher said that I am retarded, I'm a half-breed monkey, I am uneducable, and I'm a nigger whose brain is not developed. My mother said, don't you ever say that again. She shook me. And then she gave me this book that she called the Bible. And she said, memorize this statement. It was a statement in the Bible. And it simply said, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, far beyond, all I can ever ask, think, or imagine, according to the power that worketh within me. I said, now, you, now you know I know it, right? Yeah. That's how fast I said it. What book is that? What, what? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I knew that. I knew Powerful. that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Okay. See, Jeff got this down on the side. <laughs> right. So I, I memorized it. And let me quote it slowly. It says, now unto him who is able to do, exceeding, above, all you can ever ask for, think about or imagine mm -hmm. according to the power that worked within me. By the time I finished memorizing it, after three hours, I suddenly realized that what I imagined was possible and the power was not in my teacher, it was in me. Mm -hmm. I went back to the school and I decided I'm going to educate myself at age 14. So I read all the books on geometry, the books on English, the books on history. I memorized all of the calculations of algebra. 
and my classes turned around in three months I became a B student in six months an A student I graduated top of the school the following year and I became the number one student in the school by the time I graduated from high school what did Mr. Robertson say well I tell you what Mr. Robertson was a problem because when I graduated they gave me a plaque as the, the most you know improved student in the, in the, in the school mm -hmm. I took the plaque and took it to Mr. Robertson Mr. Robertson this is for you from a monkey oh! But the story doesn't end there. Of course, I got punished when I got home. My mom says, you gave the plaque away? I said, yes. I gave it to the teacher who told me that I was not able to learn. A few years after that, I went to college. I got three bachelor's degrees in four years, a master's degree in 18 months, five doctorate degrees that I have today bestowed upon me by five different universities. Well, I'm just a monkey, right? <laughs> so I went to London to facilitate a leadership uh, training course in downtown London. Hotel was filled with people, over 500 people showed up, and I'm speaking on leadership. At the end of the session, I'm, I'm sitting in the lobby of the hotel, and there's a long line of people, and I'm autographing my books for them, and they were buying books, you know, in, in that area, and this old white man with a cane walks up to me trembling. He's shaking, and he puts two of my books on the table, and I looked at them, one of them was very greasy and dirty and it was marked up and dogged and i said sir i like to see my book like this that means the person read it i said thank you so much for reading the book and the old man said this book changed my life i said sir that means so much to me as an author and i autographed the book for him and then i autographed him the, the new book he had just bought and i thanked him shook his hands and he just stood there and I said, sir, there's a line behind you. Why don't you allow others to come? And he just stood there looking at me, didn't say a word. And I said, sir, I appreciate you coming to the seminar. Thank you for coming today. Please allow the others behind you to come forward. And he just stood there looking at me, wouldn't move. I said, sir, is there something the matter? And then he said, I used to live in the Bahamas. I said, really, where? He said, in Nassau, the capital. I said, sir, that's where I'm from. I said, what did you do when you were there? He said, I was a teacher. I said, where did you teach? He said, C.H. Reeves Junior High School. I said, sir, that's my school. He said, yes, I taught there. He said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no, sir. He said, I'm Mr. Robinson. I said, you, Mr. Robinson. Then suddenly I realized, under all the wrinkles, this old man yeah. bent over was the teacher who called me a half-breed nigger monkey uneducable. retarded uneducable i jumped up from my table ran around i grabbed him and i hugged him and we hugged each other he wept on my shoulders i wept on his and all these people were in the lobby of the hotel downtown london confused they said this black man hugging this white man and they're crying and kissing each other oh. on the cheeks and everything and everybody's like what's going on here but you see that moment i realized that this man was transformed by my book mm -hmm. And while we are hugging, he said to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm saying, sorry for what? He says, I just took a train from Scotland, took the ferry. When I heard you were coming, your books are up in Scotland in our bookstores. And I saw that you were coming, and I came down to London just to see you to tell you I'm sorry. I said, sorry about what? He said, I'm just sorry. Then I realized what he meant. Yeah. And I said, Mr. Robinson, yeah. You mean you actually read the book written by a monkey and a half-breed nigger? He's, I said, you mean a monkey changed your life? And he laughed. I laughed. We hugged. We kissed each other. And I said, Mr. Robinson, don't you ever again mm. underestimate a human. That had hurt him for many years, hadn't it? Absolutely. That guilt. It, he saw my success and he remembered that he did not treat me properly. So I tell people, yeah. never cancel people. Mm -hmm. Don't assume you know anybody. And don't speak negative to any child. Because in that child could be a best-selling author. My goodness. Today, you know, my books are, in, are, are textbooks in that school. In that same school? Where he called me a monkey. Oh. In the Bahamas. And then today. you were telling me earlier on at Harvard. You went to speak at Harvard? Oh, yes. Uh, Harvard on. University. Yes. It's a school where Mr. Obama graduated from. Uh, many of the, the President of the United States in top school, Ivy League. I never dreamt that I would be asked to come to speak to Harvard University. But about five years ago, uh, one of the professors read one of my books on leadership, and he brought me in to speak. And uh, the place was packed with all these professors, critics, uh, the intellectuals of the school. 
and there was about seven, 17 to 18 different countries represented in that meeting. It was about 600 people in Harvard University. They came to listen to me lecture on leadership. And uh, I stood up, they gave me the microphone, I spoke, and uh, after about 30, 40 minutes, I got a standing ovation. So I didn't realize, I mean, I guess people applaud for me very, very often, but they said, Harvard University has never given a speaker a standing ovation. Come on. It was the first in the history of the school. And who was right after you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them. Tim Robbins. Yeah, Tim Robbins Tim is supposed Robbins. to be the number one, of course, motivated yeah. in America. Correct. Uh, he decided he was not going to speak after me anymore. <laughs> so he came up and apologized and I told him, you got to come and have lunch with me. Oh. But my point is uh, that Harvard University is an Ivy League school. And to have my books uh, there as textbooks mm -hmm. is very humbling. But to be asked to come back five years consecutively to speak, to lecture, is a very significant accomplishment for a black person. Do you have the time? Do you get the time? Well, you know, I believe that everyone is given the same amount of time every day, 24 hours. We become what we are based on how we use our 24. So no one is better than anyone. It's how they invest their 24 hours. And uh, what you are today is a result of how you use your 24 hours. If you don't like who, who you are, you must change the way you use your 24 hours. Some people sleep most of it. That's right. You know, I get an average of four hours sleep every day. Four? Four hours, yeah. Um, I'm just getting started with four. <laughs> yeah, I think you cannot really make an, an, an impact in the world and get eight hours sleep. It's impossible. Uh, if you're going to pursue your dream, there's going to be a price you have to pay. So the three words I use to, to define how I manage my life. The first word is prioritize. The second word is organize. And the third word is discipline. You must prioritize your life. You must decide what do you want to accomplish in life. Uh, document your purpose. Design your destiny. Put on paper what your plan for your life is. If you don't do that, you'll never prioritize your life. Once you know where you're going, you also know where you don't want to go. So your destiny not only defines where you are going, it also defines where you're not going. Hmm. So you are able to prioritize your life based on your destination. Then you must organize your life according to what you prioritize. In other words, be able to say no to people, even, even they may offer you something good. Good is not always right for you. The greatest distraction to people is good things, not bad things. Right. If you're going to be successful, you must be able to say no to good things, not just bad things. Because good may not be right for you. Right has to do with what takes me to my destiny. That's why I write a lot on the, on the word purpose. Mm -hmm. Purpose is really discovering why you were born. And I am convinced, Jeff, that every human being was born to specifically solve a problem in their generation. You're doing it right now. There, there, there's a problem in the world that you were born to solve. This program is actually meeting a need. You were born to meet the need of someone in your generation. So every human came to Earth with something specifically to do. And most people never find it. That's why they end up with a career instead of a call. Mm. And that's why most people are frustrated on Monday mornings because they go into a place they hate. That's right. But in fact, you're supposed to go to a place you love. And so our jobs have become our prison because we never find where our work is. Your work is different from your job. And your purpose is your work. Uh, the, what's the difference between a job and a work? Well, your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Mm. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. Your job you can retire from. Your work, you can retire from. Your job is your employment. Your work is your deployment. You, Jeff, told me a few moments ago, I used to work as a flight attendant. Correct. That was a job, mm -hmm. but that wasn't your work. Your work was your gift. Your gift was your voice. Your voice took you where you are now. So your gift never leaves you. That's why you can't retire from your voice. And no one can ever take your gift away from you, right? You can never fire a man from his work, mm -hmm. only from his job. Mm -hmm. That's why I can never be fired again as long as I live. Right. Because I've become deployed, not employed. One of the weaknesses, I think, of emerging countries in Africa and other places is that we are so focused on employment, we never focus on deployment. So we create dependency of our people rather than independence. And I think government programs need to focus more on deployment rather than employment. Uh, deployment means that you give people the right environment to pursue their dreams, maximize their potential, to deliver their gifts to the world, and to develop their own entrepreneurial spirit. If you employ me, you kill my entrepreneurial spirit. That's why you was employed as a, a flight attendant, mm -hmm. 
but folks were saying, you ain't supposed to be here. That's right. <laughs> you're in the wrong place. You don't sound like you're, yeah, you don't sound like you're supposed to be here. Yeah. Well, I used to work for, you know, for a food store, uh, packing shelves. I worked in a warehouse, lifting boxes. I was a school teacher in a classroom for five years. I was an advisor in a publishing company. I was a, in an advertising firm. And then I decided, you know, uh, I'm going to work for government. I was assistant secretary in government in the education department. And I decided I'm going to become myself. Today, I earn more in one hour than they paid me in a year. Hello. Ka-ching, ka -ching. Your prosperity is not in your education. It's in your gift. Your gift is what you were born with. Education is supposed to refine that. You don't go to school to get a gift. You go to school to refine your gift. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what your gift is, education doesn't profit you. No. That's why most people go to school, take the wrong degree, come out and be depressed to do a job they hate and, then end up doing they don't like, and they end up with nothing so i think we need to recalibrate ourselves mm. get back to what is our purpose and i believe that the greatest discovery in life is purpose because purpose gives you the reason for being born speaking of purpose doc i want to talk about change through leadership oh big because one. africa you know we you you always talk about this and you, 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 we've all heard this it is the richest continent on the planet yes bar none Yes. But one thing that we lack or we are sorely missing is leadership. Yes. Maybe it's coming around this time. Maybe there's a whole new generation. Hmm. But you've been to a lot of African countries, 132 yeah. around the world. You've seen it for yourself. I want to talk about that. The leadership issue in Africa is something we've got to talk about. I'm going to come back. Yes. But I want, I want to just preface it by saying this. Our leadership challenge is a historical one first. So I, I don't think we should judge our leaders too quickly. And we can come back and talk about that. I like that. I like that. And also, giving hope to yes. folks out there. There's a lot of folks out there who, who feel so hopeless. They don't yeah. feel tomorrow will never come. They'll never achieve anything. They'll never become anything. How do you give them hope? There's hope. Wow. What a show, Dr. <laughs> Reverend Julian Chula. Where are you? <laughs> Thank you so much, my brother. Looking out for a brother and a nation. Dr. Miles Monroe, folks, waxing lyrical on JKL, and I hope you are as enthused as I am. Don't forget POD, prioritize, organize, organize and discipline. discipline. POD. There you go. My man. I'm telling you. Woo! You're ready to go now. What a show. Mm -hmm. What a guess. <laughs> JKL is going to take a break. We'll be back. Keep tweeting at Miles Monroe, at Koinanga Jeff, the hashtag. Is JKL. JKL takes a break. We'll be back. Here, my goodness, my man. <laughs> what?